For the main objective is to analyze the problem of sharing the revenues from broadcasting sport events and for that we provide a theoretical model in which we formalize this problem, obtain some rules and end up applying them to the real case of the Spanish uh, soccer league. So we essentially impose three basic uh, assumptions or axioms of rules and obtain, therefore characterize the only ones that satisfy these axioms. That's a whole family of rules uh, that has interesting features and that actually provide rationale for some of these uh, real-life allocations that we observe in the specific case of the Spanish Football League. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, bienvenidos a todos por, por venir a esta sesión. Para mí es un placer pues, presentaros a Juan de Dios Moreno Ternero. Él es doctor por la Universidad de Alicante en, en un programa de doctorado que yo también hice ya hace unos cuantos años y también doctor por la Universidad de Yale, si no me equivoco. Tiene un, buen, un gran número de publicaciones en, en, en las mejores revistas que publican artículos de teoría de juegos, entre otras econométricas. Entonces, bueno, además que una peculiaridad es eh, es un magnífico ponente sí. y eh, bueno y cuando lo escuchéis que nos dará la charla en inglés es, vais a pensar que, que realmente es nativo <risa> bueno te dejo ya con la palabra que nos va a presentar un trabajo muy interesante sobre eventos deportivos que ayer ya hubo uno que no sé cómo se repartieron los dineros pero bueno venga muchas gracias Thank you, thank you very much, Joaquin. It's a very kind introduction, and I'm, uh, you know, uh, but I don't know what to do, what to do now. <laughs> so I, so I'm very high. So I, I hope you won't be disappointed after the talk. So this is um, this is joint work with Gustavo Bergantinos from the University uh, of Vigo, and this is a second step of a research uh, agenda, I would say, which we started working some years ago. Uh, I presented already the first stage in a, in a conference here some months ago and given that there would be some people attending this talk too, I thought it would be better to present something different. But in any case, I will introduce the uh, basics of this uh, model uh, so that everything is clear for, for everyone in the, in the audience. But please feel free to interrupt as much as you need if there is something that is uh, unclear. Uh, the title of the paper, of this second paper in this uh, research agenda, is a family of rules to share the revenues from broadcasting sport events. So as you may imagine, we're going to be concerned with this, with this general problem of, of sharing the revenues that, that are collectively obtained when uh, uh, a sport event is broadcasted. Um, let me give you a few data about this, this problem. Um, here you have some of the uh, revenues that are obtained from uh, uh, professional sport leagues in the world. Um, these are actually the top uh, leagues raising revenues. And you can see, well, maybe you cannot see, but it turns out that most of these are uh, European soccer competitions. But the top ones are in, in, in North America. So in particular, you have NFL raising $13 billion. Uh, uh, in one year. Then you have baseball with 9.5, 9 uh, uh, NBA is 4.8, and, and hockey is 3.7, and the Premier League, the, the, the British um, Soccer League, actually uh, gets to the top three, raising 5.3. So we're talking about sizable uh, numbers here. Um, and most of the times, this is collectively obtained, Actually, this in, at least in Spain, in the case of, of soccer or football, this changed some years ago uh, because it was individually uh, bargained. But by now, it's collective bargaining. And so there's an overall amount that is obtained when negotiating with these uh, operators. And the, the issue, the problem in which we want to start uh, working is the case in which once you get this amount that is collectively obtained, how do you share this among the participating uh, teams? And that's, that's the problem we, we keep in mind. And it turns out it's not a straightforward problem in the sense that, uh, to begin with, rules vary across the world. So you have uh, many different ways in which this is, this is shared. And our approach here was to try to come up with a theoretical model to analyze this problem formally and see whether we're able to to give a few indications, and now I hope I'll, I'll be able to convey some of them later. Um, 
obviously these, these huge amounts of money are crucial for the uh, sports organizations, so this is the most important source of revenue, and, and at the end of the day, the way in which these, these revenues are shared will be crucial for the sustainability of these sports organizations. And as I said, there's this uh, first uh, paper, uh, first tape in this agenda in which Gustavo and I work, and therein we introduce the formal model that I'm going to, to use in here too. And at the same time, we uh, highlighted two focal rules that will be the starting point of this, of this problem here, too, of this presentation here. Um, the model that I'm going to use uh, will fit a variety of uh, competitions, but the running example will be the sort of a uh, uh, round robin tournament in which you have a group of teams facing each other twice, once home, once away throughout the season. Um, so at the end of the day, we're going to have a matrix indicating the revenues obtained. Um, and these revenues are going to be simplified, referring to the audience that each game is, is providing when being broad broadcasted. And, and this uh, audience for the corresponding game between team I and team J will be the entry in the corresponding matrix. So that's, that, that will be the input of our model. So it will be a square matrix and with, with, with the diagonal being made of zeros, right? Because one team cannot face the same team. So to simplify, the, the underlying simplify, sorry, the underlying simplifying assumption is that we're going to have this equal pay-per-view fee. Right? So at the end of the day, once we know the number of people watching a game, we multiply by this pay-per-view fee, and then we have the revenue associated to this, to this game. Okay? So that's, that's a simplified assumption, and, and, and we're going to take it from here. Um, so as I said, in this first paper that Gustavo and I produced, uh, there were two rules that arose as the focal ones. And in a sense, these rules are sort of focal and polar to each other. In what sense? In what we call the fan effect. So to begin with, there's the um, so-called equal split rule. The equal split rule assumes that the audience of each game is equally split among the two participating teams. So the game being played yesterday, right? So there were 10 million people watching, I don't know, more or less maybe, because it was public TV. So we assume that 5 million came to watch the game because of one team, 5 million came to watch the game because of the other team. That's very naive if you want, and uh, implicitly this is saying that teams are equally important for the game. Or to put it differently, that we, don't ac we, we, we discard the existence of fan bases in the sense that we consider that there are no loyal followers of each of the teams, and people just watched again because of the two teams being playing there, right? Now the opposite, the alternative, is um, the so-called uh, consider and divide, what we call consider and divide rule. As the name indicates, this rule says, no, we're going to assume that, that teams have different fan bases. So there's a given team which has a lot of followers, there's another team which doesn't have that many followers, and so, in principle, watching a game, you, you may have people that are fan of each of the two teams and people that might just be interested into that specific game. So then what the rule suggests is to concede each team its fan base and then divide equally the residual. So that's, that's the alternative, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be formal in a, in a few seconds with the uh, introduction of these two rules, but that's pretty much the idea. Now, as I said, in a sense, these two are sort of polar. And one might say that uh, reality should be something in between. Or to put it differently, compromising between these two rules seems to be something very uh, plausible and natural. Um, and as a matter of fact, this is a starting point of this, uh, of this paper that I'm going to present here today. So the, uh, the underlying objective, at least implicitly, is to be able to compromise between these two rules. How are we going to do that? Then uh, let me just postpone that for a few minutes because I want to introduce first the formal model of which we're going to be working. <coughs> so uh, to us, a problem, a broadcasting sports problem, will be simply made of two ingredients. One is the uh, set of teams, 
that are going to be involved in this competition. And the other is this audience matrix that I mentioned before. So each entry in the matrix will refer to the number of viewers of the game involving team I and team J, the team in the, in the row and the team in the column. So once, once we have this, we can analyze the problem. And the first, first parameter we should take into account is what we call the, the claim or, or the total audience of each game, in the of, of each team in the tournament. So to be more precise, here you have, I'm, I'm aggregating across row and column. So that's indicating the overall number of viewers that that team enjoyed in the whole tournament. Okay? And you can do that for all teams. Right? So obviously, if you obtain, if you compute each of these claims, you will end up, this is basic algebra, the overall audience will be exactly one half of the aggregate claim. Right? So to put it differently, I cannot fully honor all claims because that would, that would imply that I'm having, uh, uh, so that I'm allocating more than what I actually have. So the whole point, and this is, so this is the, the input in the, uh, of the model, but the whole point is to construct what we call rules. Rules are mappings from the set of problems, so defined, to the set of allocations. So indicating for each team an amount of the overall resources that will be assigned to it. Okay? And the only condition that we impose from the outset is that we fully allocate all we have. We don't waste anything on the process. Right? So we have a pie and we share it fully among the participating teams. Now, um, let, me, let, me, let me draw your attention on something here. So as you can see, there's no positive sign here. So in principle, I'm allowing for negative awards too. So I'm allowing for the option that I um, punish some teams because they are a negative externality in the competition, right? You may well think of cases in which you have teams that are not fully competitive that make the competition less interesting than uh, the competition was without that team, for instance. Or to put it differently, we may have teams free riding on the prestige of the competition and we may want to um, uh, make them compensate the others for that. Okay, so in principle, I'm not ruling out that possibility. I want to make that clear. Okay? Now, um, so this is the model. And let me introduce formally the two rules I mentioned before. The equal split rule and the consider and divide rule. Both have this common ground in the sense that the starting point of each of the rules is to assign tentatively to each team the claim of that team. But as I said before, we cannot fully honor all teams giving the whole claims to all of them because we don't have enough. So what we do is to subtract from the claim something that is attributed to the other teams. Okay? So essentially what I'm saying is that for any given team, this is the claim. This is the overall number of viewers that team had. But as I said, this team is facing another team each time in each game. So you could say that, in principle, this should be attributed to team I, but this should be attributed to the other n minus one teams. Okay? So what we're going to say is that each of the other teams should be getting something of this pie, let's say. Right? So at the end of the day, what I'm saying is that the overall amount will be this minus n minus one times something. Now the whole point is to determine what this something is. Okay? And here you have two options. So if for instance you take this as x, we we'll call beta i here, that, that's an equal sharing of the of half of the of the of the claim, then you end up having the equal split rule. <coughs> now this is more interesting. This gamma i, this is the average audience in the games in which I is not playing, right? So essentially, what I attribute to the other teams is some sort of average of the audience of the games in which those other teams are playing, right? And that's what's considered and device saying. 
if you play a little bit with the algebra, you end up having that equal split is as simple as this. It's, it's just giving one half of the claim to all of the teams, whereas consider and divide some sort of convex combination between this rule and the uniform rule that it splits equally the overall pi. Okay? Um, so those are two, uh, two rules. We can discuss about them a little bit more. Uh, but instead of trying to convince you about the goodness of this mathematical formulation, I want to move on to take what we normally call the axiomatic approach. Right? Some of you might be familiar, the axiomatic approach is some sort of a bridge between math and politics, let's say. So instead of providing mathematical rules, mathematical formulations directly to solve the problem, I'll be imposing some principles, uh, some properties that we believe rules should have. And these properties, or axioms, hence the name, will be translating some principles that we find relevant either from an ethical viewpoint or from an operational viewpoint. So in particular, for instance, we start with something as simple as equal treatment of equals, which is a standard formulation of the idea of impartiality. Here we're saying that if we have two teams producing the same audiences each time they play another third team, no matter what that third team is, then the two teams should get the same. That's what it's saying. Okay? Seems to be a natural uh, property and requirement, a very minimal uh, requirement of, 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 of justice, of impartiality, and we want our rules to satisfy this property. We don't know what the rule will be yet, but this is a property we want to impose. Okay? Now, let me also suggest another. This is the idea of additivity with a long tradition in axiomatic work um, and it's simply saying that you can split the solution of a problem in two differently. If you want to allocate the revenues obtained in two seasons you can do that by al allocating first the revenues in the first season and allocating then the second season and aggregating. You can do that, right? That's the idea of additivity. It's probably it's not uh, ethical, or it doesn't have an ethical content, but it's operational, right? And it's functional in a sense, right? Um, it all, obviously it has more implications than that, but, but, the, but the interpretation is what I, what I gave before. Okay? And there's a third uh, condition, which is what we call maximum aspirations. This property is simply saying that no team will get something higher than the original claim. Remember what I said, this alpha i was this overall number of viewers the team had, right? So what we're saying is that no team will get more than this. Seems very natural, right? It's a very natural upper bound for each, for each team. Okay, uh, so what if we agree, suppose this, this, so I said before, there's this bridge between politics and math. So what if, polit when I say politics, I mean politicians or lawmakers or, or people in charge, have no uh, mathematical background, right? Have difficulty understanding mathematical reasoning, but agree that these three properties seem natural. Suppose that they agree that whatever the rule is, they want the rule be satisfying these three properties. So then the bridge is to explore the implications saying, trying to be able to come up with a unique rule that satisfies these properties. That's what we normally call an, an axiomatic characterization or a characterization result. Well, it turns out, and this is the main result that I want to present, is that we know exactly the rules satisfying these three properties. So if we want a rule satisfying the three properties I just introduced, the rule must be a member of a family of rules that we call the EC family of rules. I didn't introduce the family yet, but this is what the result says. If you want to have these three properties, you have to consider one rule in this family, and vice versa, right? If you use one rule in this family, then you'll be guaranteeing these three properties. So this is the beauty of a characterization result, right? If you like the properties, you must like the rules, and vice versa. If you like the rules, you like the properties. If there's a property you don't like, then you don't like the rules satisfying these properties. 
If you don't like the rules, it's because you don't like some of the properties. You see, it goes back and forth. Now, what's this family? Well, this family is very simple. This family turns out to be the family of rules made of convex combinations of the two rules that I introduced before. What do I mean by a convex combination? What I mean is that for any problem, uh, you pick a number between 0 and 1, and then the corresponding rule to this parameter, to this lambda, will be giving us the convex combination with these weights, lambda and 1 minus lambda, of the solutions the two rules I introduced before provide for this problem. So you have the equal split outcome, you have the consider and divide outcome, and you put weights to these two. Weights coming from 0 to 1. It's a convex combination. Okay? So that's it. That's, that's the result. Um, well, well if, if we take this from here, you may say, well, but you, have, you didn't finish in the sense that you have a whole family. Right? It's not just one rule. You have many rules in here. For each parameter, you have a different rule. You could put additional axioms to pick some of them. And in particular, in our previous paper, we do have an additional axiom and pick these corner solutions. But I don't want to take that route. What I'm going to do in this presentation is a bit different, in the sense that um, I'm going to explore some properties of this family of rules. How am I going to do that? Well, in particular, well, let me start to make, uh, to make the discussion simpler. Let's assume without loss of generality that we have a problem in which teams are labeled from 1 to n, and these claims are increasingly ordered. Let's assume that at least there's one straight inequality. Otherwise, we have fully equal uh, teams, and then the solution seems to be obvious for that problem. So a more interesting problem has at least one straight inequality here. Okay? Um, and then we have a first property to report. The property is, is the so-called single crossing property. It says that when you have the team so ordered and you pick two rules in the family, the rule corresponding, so the rules only cross once, let me put it this way. So you'll be able to identify a team below which all teams prefer the first rule above which all teams prefer the second rule. You may say, okay, so what? That's a mathematical curiosity. And it is. But it turns out that this has very important implications. In particular, it has implications for what I say in the statement for, for the preferences that teams will have with respect to the rules. So in particular, <coughs> this condition guarantees that there's something that we call a majority vote in equilibrium. So if we ask, suppose we don't know how to decide the rule within the family, right? We don't have arguments to pick one. And we decentralize this decision. So we go to the teams and ask them to report the rule they want more. And they vote according to majority. And we take the rule that is the winner according to majority. Well, this may not always be fine in the sense that you may not have a solution for this problem, right? For those of you who are uh, sufficiently trained in social choice, this is the most fundamental problem in social choice, and it's the voting problem. We know that there are, you know, the so-called paradox of voting, and then we may have majority cycles and things like that, right? But what this property guarantees is that for the family of rules satisfying the property, you will always be able to find this majority voting equilibrium. Okay? So if we indeed decentralize this decision and ask teams to decide themselves about the rule that is going to be used, then there will be an answer for this. Okay? And what's that answer? What's, what's the majority uh, vote in equilibrium? Or the majority winner, if you prefer? Well, let me, um, let me actually report it in here because it's, it's very neat. Uh, so what are we having here? Here we have the average claim. This alpha bar, you take all the claims and divide by n. And let's have these three sets. So teams that are below the average, teams that are above the average, and teams that are at the average. Okay? Well, the result is that if the uh, set of individuals, let's say the set of teams, 
with claim below the average it's uh, bigger than the other two together if the number of teams with a claim below the average is higher than the number of teams with claims above the average then the equal split is the majority winner and the unique one okay if instead the number of teams with claims above the average is higher than the number of all the other teams then consider and divide is the unique majority winner and in all other cases any rule within the family will be a majority winner okay so it's, it's very it's very neat in a sense very clean the answer for this problem um, you could actually reframe these problems in terms of the so-called median overall audience you know I talk about the average you can talk about the median by definition the median is what you know leaves half of the population to the left half of the population to the right given that this is a discrete distribution we have to be a bit more careful in the in, in notation and in particular we have to distinguish whether we have an odd or an even number of teams but that's that's simply what we have to do and well essentially the result the result we have is that if the median is below the mean right namely that the distribution is skewed um, uh, to the left then equal split is the unique majority winner if it's the opposite skewed to the right in the sense that the, the, the median is above the average right then consider and divide is the unique majority winner and if it's exactly uh, the median aligned with the with the with the average then any rule with it will be a majority winner I mean this is this is a standard feature in economics right when we, when we talk about for instance income distributions and in, uh, this is a uh, it's, it's a well uh, known phenomenon that in, in, in all advanced democracies we have the median income below the mean income right because in general we have a few very rich individuals that skew the distribution so we have more poor individuals than rich individuals right in those cases that would be the first step the equal split will be the winner because what's underlying behind these results is that the equal split rule is the rule favoring the weaker teams let's say the teams with lower claims what as consider and divide is favoring the stronger teams let's say teams with a higher claim okay and of course if, if you have a flat let's say distribution then anything goes essentially okay so it seems that you know the family is very natural it's, it's compromising in the easiest way it's compromising between these two rules I mentioned just with this standard uh, averaging procedure this, this standard compass combination but it seems to be well structured too in the sense that this, this, this um, single crossing property is giving us some structure to obtain for instance um, a clear cut solution for the decentralized problem in which we let agents decide instead of having a social planner doing that uh, okay so that's um, uh, that's one thing um, so here of course when, when it's uh, that the previous result was for the odd case for the even case is slightly different because you have to reframe in terms of the of the median but it's pretty much pretty much the same okay now what else this um, this uh, notion of single crossingness also have additional uh, consequences mm, not only this this um, majority winner this is the existence of these majority winners but there's also an interesting implication regarding the what we call the distributive power of the rules so once we uh, in resource allocation problems we may be concerned about the spread of the allocation how unequal the allocation is or how equal the allocation is and again this is a pervasive problem in, in economics so when we talk about income inequality for instance right uh, so there's a huge literature dealing with income inequality measurement and there's no consensus because this is a very simple problem from a mathematical viewpoint 
right? There's only one way of being equal, there are infinite ways of being unequal. So when you have a vector, it's clear when all the coordinates of the vector are equal. But when the coordinates are unequal, how unequal this vector is. This is mathematically speaking, this is not a trivial problem to be solved. Now, in economics, there's a well-known result saying that uh, the most fundamental principle of, of inequality, of income inequality, if you want to have that interpretation, is the so-called Lorentz dominance criterion. So when you have a vector that can be obtained from another via a sequence of progressive transfers, right? That means that the second one is unequivoc unequivocally more equal than the first one, right? What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that that principle, the Lorentz dominance criterion, is only a partial ordering. So let me be formal about it for those of you that are not familiar. Suppose I have two vectors here in which coordinates are increasingly older and suppose the, uh, uh, the average of both vectors is the same. Okay? So we say that X Lorentz dominates Y if the partial sums of the coordinates is higher at X than at Y, weakly higher. Right? So the let's say the minimum number in one vector is higher or equal than the minimum number in the second vector. The sum of the two lowest numbers here is higher than the sum of the two lowest numbers here, and so on and so forth. Okay? If that happens, then we say that one vector dominates the other, and we can safely argue that the former is more equal than the latter. Right? Now, as you may imagine, this is only a partial ordering, in the sense that you may well have two vectors that cannot be ordered according to this principle. Neither the first is better than the second, nor the second is better than the first. But when it happens that you can indeed order both, then you can safely argue that one is more equal than the other. End of the story. For those other cases, we need to dig uh, more. Okay, so we can, we can import this notion to our context and say that a rule is more egalitarian than another if for each problem you think of, the allocation provided by the first one dominates the allocation provided by the second one. As I said before, given that this is a partial ordering, one might not expect that this always happens, right? That you can indeed order two rules according to this principle. But it turns out that in this family they do. We can fully rank all the members of the family according to the parameter defining the family. So to put it differently, the result is like this. If you have two parameters, lambda 1 and lambda 2, the rule corresponding to the highest parameter dominates, therefore it's more egalitarian than the rule corresponding to the first parameter. So in particular, the most egalitarian rule in the family is the rule corresponding to lambda equal to 1, which is the equal split, of course, it's split inequally. And consider and divide, which corresponds to uh, lambda equal to 0, is the last equal rule in the family, within the family. Okay? This, this can be proved directly, but it just requires a little bit of algebra, but it's also a consequence, it can be proven directly as a consequence of the single crossing property that I introduced at the beginning. So, since we have a well-structured uh, family that, that, you know, it's, it's normatively grounded on this axiomatic characterization that I presented before, on this very uh, naive and intuitive principles, but then, once we have the family supported by that, we see that the family has interesting features to add to it. Okay? Now, having said that, I believe that there's, uh, is, 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 is now the time, I have 20 minutes, a bit more, okay? Yeah. So, uh, let, me, let me apply this. Of, uh, of course, if there are some questions, I can take them now or, or later at the end, whatever you prefer, right? But, but, the theoretical results are already presented. Now I, I want to apply these results to a real life case. And this is actually funny. You know, uh, I didn't mention this, but I have to be honest. So uh, the main reason why I started working on this with Gustavo is because he and I are both soccer fans, right? And 
We have been working before we started with this project. And we noticed that we were spending too much time talking about football, right, while, while, while working. And then he had the brilliant idea of saying, why don't we work on football, right, soccer? Um, and, and it's brilliant in the sense that now we, our conscience is clean, right? Every time we meet, even if we're talking about football, it's, it feels we're working, right? Uh, it's not always the case, not always the case. That. And if I'm checking uh, uh, Marcus' website, I'm, you know, it's field work, right? I'm just getting data for my, uh, for my research. And in a sense, it is. In a very small sense, sometimes, to be, to be honest. Anyway, so, so the, the application, it's, it, as I said, the model applies to uh, all sports, but in particular, the model applies perfectly well to the case of Spanish football, to the Spanish Football League, um, which has all the ingredients that are required for the model that I presented before. It's a round-robin tournament. You have 20 teams. Each team plays another twice. Therefore, there are 80, 38 weeks, let's say. All games are broadcasted. Uh, we're going to concentrate on, on national broadcasting within Spain, not outside uh, Spain, because uh, you know not all games are broadcasted abroad. So that will bring a bias there. And, and this is funny, uh, you know, there's no overlapping. So in principle, you know, you can start watching football in Spain on a Friday evening and finish on a Monday evening. You don't do anything else, right? You just the whole weekend devoted to watching <laughs> football. But you can do that. It, it's feasible in principle, right? Um, so so uh, everything goes as, as, as the model suggests. Okay, one thing I'm, you know, I should mention because it'll play a role in the results later. And I'll, I'll, uh, there's a caveat. So in principle, out of those 10 games you can watch each week, one of them is, is public TV. Another, the other is cable TV, the other nine games, right? That will affect audiences because, you know, in public TV, normally you have more people watching, right? Uh, so, okay, that, that's a caveat. Fine. Oh, uh, that might be a bit more difficult to get, but it was... It's um, big enough for me. Okay, <laughs> but not for the, for the bottom. Um, uh, maybe? I don't know if I'll be able to... Yeah, maybe? Okay, maybe, yeah, like this. Okay, what are I having here? So here is, uh, as the title suggests, this is uh, audiences and revenues for the last season, the season that finished in the summer, okay? So what are we having here? The first column is this uh, claims that I introduced before, these alphas, right, for each of the teams. And they are ranked decreasingly, okay? Uh, the second column is normalized Y. Normalized Y because here you have the um, overall number of millions of viewers in the tournament, right? Whereas we have this overall amount of money. So we just multiply by this constant factor to normalize. It's like we introduce a pay-per-view fee that is exactly this divided by this. Mm -hmm. It's about seven euros, more or less. Okay? So this is the number we're going to use. And this is actually the amount of money that each team was getting in the allocation process, in the last allocation process that was unveiled. This is public knowledge. You can go to the Liga's website and you can get these numbers. Okay, because they're supposed to be transparent um, and they provide these numbers. They don't provide, they don't provide the matrix that I was uh, using in my model. Namely, they don't provide the audience of each single game in the tournament. But they do provide, the, not, 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 not La Liga, but some other companies do provide the aggregate number of viewers here. Uh, okay, there, there might be issues in how do they get these numbers. Right? So, for instance, it's not clear how they uh, consider audiences coming from restaurants or bars as opposed to uh, houses, let's say. Um, but anyway, we take this as a data. We're not going to get into the details about that because there's not much we can do about it. And this is in relative terms, right? So, as you can see, 
the two powerhouses, namely Madrid and Barcelona, get essentially together one-fourth, a little bit less than one-fourth. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this, this wasn't the case some years ago. Five years ago, combined, it was almost one-half. This was a political issue. To the extent, you may believe this or not, if you go to the Spanish official bulletin of the state, May 1st, 2015, you will see a decree published in there in which the government regulates the allocation of revenues on, obtained from La Liga's uh, uh, business. So you may think of many important issues in which the government should you know, be saying something. I wouldn't say football is one of them, right? But it turns out in Spain, Football became so important that the Spanish government decided to intervene and legislate. To the extent that, you know, the government imposed many requirements. One of the requirements was that this bargaining process had to be collective. In the old times, these teams were going sequentially to the cable companies to negotiate their uh, rights, selling their rights to these uh, uh, companies. Now it's, it's collective. And on top of that, the government imposed some strict conditions on this allocation process. Okay? The outcome of that regulation was to move from this uh, more unequal uh, process or system to the current one. Okay? But still, it's not clear how this was obtained. We have some indications from the government, and I can give you uh, a few more details about it in a few seconds, but we don't know how this was obtained. Therefore, we want to see whether our model can say something, whether our results can say something. Um, and they can. Well, otherwise it would be a bit uh, disappointing, right? So anyway, so what are we having here? So we have, again, the same 20 teams, right? And this is the allocation that took place. And in these columns, we have the two <coughs> corners of our family, the equal split and the consider <coughs> and divide. And here, in this column, we have blue, when we say above, it means that these teams are getting more than what our two rules would be saying. The red means that they're getting less than what the two rules are saying. So below the minimum, this is above the maximum. And the others are in between. And the number is the parameter in our family that gets closer to the amount they got. Okay? So what can we say from here? That there are two teams that are unfairly treated, right? One even more unfairly treated than the other. Okay? Fair enough. So far, so good. Now, this is not the end of the story. I do it this way because I want to have a high font. Here the comparison uh, might be uh, clear in the sense that, again, we have the first column for the allocation, the second column for equal split. Here's the difference between um, the allocation and equal split. And here we have another possibility. This possibility is, is, is the member of our family corresponding to one-fourth. Okay? Why one-fourth? Well, I could give you here a few indications, but in principle we believe that there should be a real compromise between the two. And we thought of one-fourth as something focused. You could say, why not one-half? Okay, so one-fourth was just, just to illustrate this a little bit. We don't have... Uh, we do have some, um, um, let's say, arguments to favor this, but it would require a lot of time to explain them. So let me, let me just say that, that this is this one uh, rule we're considering here. And again, we do the same exercise. We obtain the difference between the actual allocation and what this rule is saying. And again, you have either red or black numbers. So black numbers meaning uh, they get more, red numbers meaning they get a deficit, right? Um, and again, you have some teams that are not favored with the actual allocation, depending on the rule. But again, there are some teams that are unfairly treated here. Okay? 
What else? As I said before, we know a little bit about the actual process, the actual allocation process that the La Liga implements after the government decided to legislate. In particular, the government imposed a three-stage process. The first stage being the following. Of the overall pie, you get one half of it and split it equally among all teams. There's a lower bound. Everybody will get um, one uh, nth of one half, let's say. Okay, that's one half of the pie that we already dealt with. Another fourth of the pie will be shared according to performance. What do we mean by that? We take the results, the outcomes the teams got in the last five seasons, right? If they were first, second, third, and so on and so forth. And we take sort of an index of performance in the last five uh, seasons, in particular zero if you were in the second division, if you were relegated, right? And then we allocate this one-fourth proportionally according to this performance. And then for the last one-fourth, uh, the government says something combining ticket sales and what they call social relevance. Social re relevance is not specified, we take it as indicating the audiences that they are indeed producing. So what we do then is the following. We take this hybrid definition of, of the rules. We take this one half of equal split, uh, sorry, of, of, of equal sharing, one fourth according to performance, and that's something that is imposed. And then the remaining one fourth, we use our rules. Okay? Actually, it's not one fourth, it's one sixth because, as I said, ticket sales will account for part of it. So here in this column, I have this equal sharing of, of the one uh, half. Performance is this, ticket sales is this, okay? And then we have our two rules, the corners, equal split and consider and divide, divided by six, because they only divide one six of the pie, okay? And we aggregate, and here we have the hybrid equal split and the hybrid consider and divide. Now here, I believe, okay, no, yes, that's fine. So I. Now the interesting thing would be to compare this with the actual allocation. How close do we get? And this is something that we can do in the next table. Oh, sorry, this one, table five. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, so this is actually something. So again, we're going to equal split, consider and divide. And this is the audiences that they were having in this uh, in these two seasons. So in a, in a way, so this is the, as I said in here, the portion of the hybrid rules corresponding to audiences. So this is the one sixth that I mentioned before, right? And this is what audiences are uh, indicating, right? So again, we can obtain here the teams that are favored in the sense that they get something above these two amounts. The things that are hurt, namely that they get an amount below, and finally the things that are in between, for which we determine the rule within our family, the parameter of our family, they would agree with the numbers they end up having. And again, there are some things that are not fairly treated, the red ones, and the intersection with the subset of things that were unfairly treated before is, is unique, right? And it's actually this one, okay? And this is the last table. Here we compare the part that they should be obtaining from audiences, this one sixth with, of our hybrid rules with the family. And here we get this, this uh, member of the family, this 0.29, that again, I don't have time to give the arguments why we favor this rule within our family, and compare. Again, black numbers meaning that they are fairly treated, or treated better than what the rule says, red numbers indicating that they're uh, poorly treated. 
and again there's a target striking situation here okay um, so uh, probably this with a lot of numbers here um, what what can you take out of all these tables so you can take several things first uh, that we do have arguments to sort of rationalize the decision that was being taken by the National Football League. We cannot argue that there is a single rule within our family fully explaining the result uses. So to put it differently, they didn't know about our paper. And even, even if they would know about our paper, I doubt they would consider it. But uh, we can provide some rationale for what, what is being uh, 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 dumb, right? And it's something very clear. There's one thing that is unfairly treated no matter what, right? No matter what, okay? And, and, and that's a fact. That's a scientific fact. <laughs> With one caveat. The caveat is that this theme was mostly broadcasted uh, in public TV last year, okay? Which in principle increase uh, uh, the numbers to some extent. That is not happening this year because you know, in Spain, so La Liga negotiate different blocks, let's say. They negotiate rights to broadcast one, the most interesting game per week, for instance, which always includes either Madrid or Barcelona. There's another package uh, to broadcast this game on public TV with the caveat that this game on public TV can never have a team playing European competitions. And then the big package broadcasting the other eight games. So normally, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this has an influence on, on numbers, as I said before, right? And they should be taken into account. But this year, as I said, this year, this team was playing European competitions and therefore was not being broadcasted in public. So that might be considered and that might play a role. We don't make that distinction in our model. We don't have uh, the tools for that. Okay. Um, and another thing is that what, what, uh, what the government did by legislating was to come up with a process, allocation process, that is more equal, less skewed. I'm not saying that it's uh, fairer right uh, you know fairness is a tricky issue it's a tricky concept here so I'm not claiming that it's more fair or less because that depends on, on, on the concepts of justice you can think of right some people might argue that if you attract more audience therefore you should um, uh, you know uh, reward that but at the same time we shouldn't forget that this is a joint venture Right, and, and it, you know you don't have a game if you don't have at least two teams, and you know there's 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 rumors now about uh, in, in the case of basketball in Spain that some of the leading teams might be departing from the domestic competition, especially Real Madrid after the, the scandal in, in in the in the final game a week ago, right? And so this 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 uh, you know this kind of issues should be taken into account because. Uh, Potentially, you may have a product that is hurt by either being very competitive or being less competitive. But you know, in, in, in Spain, in the last 14 years, maybe 15, if, if things continue like this, there was only once a team winning the tournament, which was neither Madrid nor Barcelona, in the last 14 years. However, in the UK, in the last six years, there were four different champions. Probably five in the, la in, the in the in the last seven if Liverpool wins this year, which is the likely case at this point, right? Well, likely at least they're ahead, right? And some people claim that this is because the allocation process in the Premier League is much more even than in here. But then, and I finish with this, uh, it's not clear to me what the objective should be. What is the virtue of having a more equal? Uh, competition. You may claim that a more equal competition makes a more attractive product. However, in this last 14 years, Spain has been consistently increasing numbers. My claim, this is based on nothing, is that <laughs> people enjoyed watching Messi scoring three times 
of four times per game or Cristiano Ronaldo more than watching a game in which Villarreal was, you know, one-to-one -one with Valencia, for instance, to give an example. So, let's say a more competitive tournament doesn't need to be a better product. So it's not clear what makes a better product here. And there, you know, you would need probably a sort of a marketing strategy to analyze what's indeed, um, you know, the qualities of the product we're, we're selling. And that's beyond the scope of this paper. So what we were concerned with in here was with this specific problem of sharing the revenues that are collectively obtained, which is not a trivial problem, and is, uh, you know, uh, far from simple in the sense that you have a lot of options to deal with. And the way in which you solve this, this problem might be crucial for the development of the product in itself, for the tournament, right? And so that was a, sort of a summary, and uh, so wrapping up, we, we studied this problem of sharing the revenues from broadcasting <coughs> sport event. And the main result is that three basic and intuitive axioms characterize a whole family of rules, a one parameter family of rules in, the, in which the parameter determines the rule. These rules compromise between two focal and somewhat polar rules. And on top of that, the family has interesting features in the sense that, you know, you guarantee that decentralizing the situation here, you may have a solution, you will have a solution with a majority vote in equilibrium. That uh, outcomes are fully ranked according to this Lawrence dominance criterion, and that the family provides rationale for the, for the schemes that exist in real life. And I believe I was on time, so yeah. I stop in here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. this uh, excellent lecture about how to approach a real problem from an asymmetrical point of view. In this case, a conflicting problem. Yes. And so, someone has uh, any question? Uh -huh. Ricardo. Short question. Okay. So one is, imagine that you have two matrices that generate the same alpha. Two teams. Two, no, two matrices, A. Oh, oh matrices, uh, sorry, yes, sorry, sorry. Two matrices that end up in the same alpha or it's possible to yes so do the elements of your family generate the same allocation or not yes so so okay this uh let me i i thought partially about that question um in the in the following sense even though the input of our model is the whole matrix yeah. the rules we consider essentially require only the alphas and that you saw that at the end of the day, the application I provided was only making use of that. So the alphas were enough for us. So if you have the same alphas, the answer is, is yes, the rules in our, in our family wouldn't distinguish. I should be more careful about it, but I'd say 90% yes. Because if, if, the, if it is the case, then you're saying that you're very efficient from an information point of view. Exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, good point. So when we started with this, project we were really scared that we would be unable to provide an application because we we talked to some teams in Spain and they didn't want to provide the numbers I mean we do have the numbers to be honest but those numbers are private information and we have the numbers we're not allowed to use them so it's, we don't have the numbers <laughs> but the, these alphas are public knowledge and it's enough for our analysis yes but it's because by accident we got those rules we were not expecting those, but it's true that on, on the informational basis, we're, we're minimalistic. Yes. And the second question is, I know that you have an axiomatic justification for the family of rules. Yes. But what you do is, you take the same problem, yes. you apply two rules, two focal rules, they equal, yes. they equal split. split and they consider bad, and then you make the combination of that. Yes. And an alternative would be, so you take the matrix A, you split the matrix into the parts, make it a complex combination, and then you apply to each of those parts one of those focal rules. And then you add. And you see what happens. In principle, this method is not equivalent to what you do in, the, in, in your paper. But uh, for it, it, if you are allowed, if you allow for the complex combination, one to apply. Yeah, but how would, as, as you said, I mean, we arrive to the family in second sequence of imposing the axioms. I, I, but if you start, suppose that is not your concern, so you start from that family because you believe it's mathematically intuitive. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what would be the argument 
to split the matrix in the first place. So you, you, you're suggesting to use two different rules I'm to do the. Like, I have this pi. I'm going to divide this part of the pi according to one criterion, and that's going to be one of the rules. And I'm going to divide the, the other part of the pi and, uh, according to another criterion. Yeah, but how do you how do you make that, that cut? Part, let's say. The same way you make the cut for the Cobb's combination. So you have you have the lambda. So you say that for every possible lambda, depending on the lambda, you have a you have a rule, right? So I then you generate a family in the same way. So depending on the lambda. Yeah, but you but, but if you have a lambda in mind, let's say twenty percent. Yeah. Are you suggesting that that lambda is in, implemented to each entry? Do you say to each entry you divide it equally with that lambda, or is the matrix of the of the, 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 the norm of the matrix? Not the whole matrix. Yeah, you have a matrix, and you want to construct two matrices from this one. So, for, so you take the twenty percent of each possible entry. Of the matrix, entry, okay, yes, and yes. You take the, the other eighty percent of the other part of the matrix, and then you apply those different criteria. So, to each we, without thinking, just beyond this this one minute after you made the question, I'd say that even though the family might not be the same, the outcomes might be the same. So the two families might be outcome equivalent in the sense that for any allocation you obtain in our family, there will be a member of your family giving the same. I'm just guessing because of additivity, but it's, it's, but it's my conjecture is that at the same time the two families will not be the same. In the sense that for a lambda in our family there's a rule, and for a lambda in your suggestion there will be another rule, and these two rules might not be the same. Okay, but it's just a conjecture. I will have to think more about that. Yes. <coughs> More question? Well, I have a yes. Well, it's uh, about the proportional rule. Yes. Yes. Uh, how far is the proportional rule from your family? No, the proportional. I mean, the proportional to what? If yes. it's proportional to claims, yes, it's example. exactly the equal split. The equal split. It's exactly the equal split. Why? Because, as I said, the overall mm -hmm. entry of the matrix, when you aggregate all the entries, is exactly one half of aggregating all yeah. the claims. So then you give one half of the claim to each. So the, 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 the proportional so conceived would be equal split here. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 yes. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>